Episode 6 starts off with Emilico and Sean walking up some stairs. Sean wonders how the meeting is going and is worried about John. Emilico says not to worry. There's five days left until the rejoicing party and they should work hard to fill in the map. It's a nighttime expedition. As they're looking around the room, Emilico decides to head out onto the roof. Sean follows her and they both sit down and Emilico asks if he ever wants to go outside, outside of Shadow's house. Sean asks what's wrong. Emilico says she feels sort of unsettled and depressed. She keeps thinking about how she's human and wondering what that means, and what will change if her human memories return completely. She doesn't remember anything right now. Sean says that he's the same and she's right, and that if they come from the village, if they did leave Shadow's house, would they be able to go back there? Would they be happy? At the house, they aren't given much time to sleep, and cleaning is an enormous task. Compared to the Shadow Masters, their meals are meager, but life in the village might be much the same. Emilico begins to wonder what they used to do. Sean and Ricky must have been born into wealthy families because they already know how to read and write. Sean believes that Ricky was probably a nouveau riche type and that his family were probably commissioned merchants. Emilico says, oh, commissioned merchants. And I was like, oh my fucking god. Emilico says that she's good at needlework, so maybe her work had something to do with sewing. But she's strong, so maybe she grew crops. And that Lou seems like she'd be a gardener. Sean says he can't imagine what Shirley was like. Emilico says that she was probably the shop girl everyone went to see. Emilico starts to wonder why they're called living dolls. If they're bringing children from the village, they could simply say that the children are humans serving the house. But Sean says that if they did that, their lack of memories would raise questions. This way, no matter how they're treated, they think it's because they're living dolls. It's to make them less aware of their own lives. Sean brings up how they're made to believe that they were created in the image of their shadow masters. But the opposite is true, isn't it? Emilico doesn't think so. They eat and everything after all. Even if you look at them, their voices and personalities are different. Even if they look like them, their voices and personalities are different. Sean goes on how the Shadow Masters are raised in imitation of the humans at their sides. And he's certain that they're influenced by those humans as well. One time, John told Sean that there isn't much difference between how much he remembers and how much John does. He lived in his room for a while, then Sean came. And that maybe interaction with humans is what brings their consciousness forward. If that's the case, then they don't know if the Shadow Masters are the same age as them. Emilico brings up that the Goodnight Kiss is a rule set by Shadow's house. Maybe it's necessary for them to become more human. Emilico brings up Ram and Shirley. Shirley never said a single word. Maybe she couldn't speak because Ram was too timid for them to interact much, so she couldn't become more like a human. Sean remembers that when their master dies, they're made to wear mourning clothes, and that the clothes the Veiled Dolls wear are mourning clothes, meaning that Rum could be somewhere among the Veiled Dolls. Sean is certain that his name is actually John. When you consider the relationship between living dolls and shadows, doesn't it seem natural to give the human's name to the shadow? They try calling each other by their master's names, but it doesn't feel right at all. Emilico likes the name that Kate gave her. Sean then wonders where Kate got the knowledge that living dolls are humans from. Emilico mentions that there are a lot of things Kate hasn't told her yet, so as not to overwhelm her, but will eventually tell her. The clouds disappear and reveal the night sky. Emilico says that she remembers seeing the night sky, but at Shadow's house, They've never seen it before, meaning that it's a memory from when she was human. They head back inside to finish the rest of the map, but the robed figure shows up out of nowhere and grabs the map. She tells them not to worry, she's not their enemy, though she's not their ally either. Emilico tries to show Sean the figure, but she disappears. Emilico reports this all back to Kate, 
And then the next day, the living dolls are awoken earlier than normal and are told to hurry to the Great Hall. The Star Bearers enter, but this time their Shadow Masters accompany them. Barbara informs them that they will now begin their, their rejoicing party. Emilico thinks to herself it's four days early. Emilico is unable to spit out the coffee into her clothes because the Shadow Masters are watching them. Emilico is up and she has no choice but to swallow. Mia is chosen as the representative this time. Emilico reports back to Kate about the rejoicing party and how the Shadow Masters were there as well and that she drank the coffee. It was incredibly bitter but she's now filled with enthusiasm. Kate tells her to sit down but Emilico ignores her. Kate controls Rolly and tricks Emilico into sitting. Kate uses her suit to bind Emilico to the chair and Kate makes her drink water but it doesn't do anything. Kate then notices that something is strange. Emilico won't stop talking so Kate covers her eyes with suit and begins to think over the situation. Just now when Emilico said the coffee was bitter her expression said she didn't like it. At the debut, once the brainwashing came into effect, she thought it was delicious. And currently she won't do what Kate tells her to do, but before she was overly obedient and wonders if she possesses her own will this time. And if it was different from the usual coffee. She's certain that the brainwashing coffee served at the debut and rejoicing parties are made in Lord Grandfather's wing. When the coffee carfés broke, the star bearers were greatly shaken, so she can't imagine they'd be able to immediately procure more. What Emilico and the others drank this time was most likely ordinary coffee. By holding a rejoicing party, living dolls were given psychological peace of mind, and wonders if they mix something that can manipulate minds into the coffee. She says no. There were shadows at the party, so that must mean that the living dolls were being controlled with suit mind powers. The power probably has the effect of heightening emotions, and comes to the conclusion that Emilico and Sean haven't been brainwashed. Their emotions have simply been stirred up. And that the person with enough suit power to manipulate everyone's emotions must be Benjamin. The next day, Kate and John are working separately, and Kate tells them what actually happened and that they're not brainwashed. Kate told John to keep their secrets and to act on his own discretion. John takes this as a sign of her trust in him. John will use fixing the wall as a pretext to interact with the research team to obtain information. The plan turns out to be a bust. All they ended up doing is fixing the wall and only one of the research team members is there. Jeremiah and Jeremy. Jeremiah and Jeremy get up to walk over and they put a spirit level on John's work. Jeremiah shakes his head and says disgraceful. Jeremy interprets what Jeremiah says by saying being off is disgraceful. John notices that Jeremiah sleeps during the day and is active at night. That means he's the robed figure. He goes to confront them and notices a cloth and asks what it's for. John pulls the cloth away to reveal scorches and cages. John accuses them of being behind the phantom disturbance. Jeremiah just says soap. And Jeremy interprets what Jeremiah says as, and if Jeremiah is the culprit, what do you intend to do? John pulls his fist back and says defeat you, but Jeremiah pins him to the ground. Jeremy does the same with Sean. Jeremy puts a scorch cage in front of Sean, and Jeremiah says, don't think you'll simply be allowed to leave. Sean begins to emit suit, and Jeremiah sucks it up with a vacuum. Jeremy tells him that what Jeremiah meant was, John, as you have a high suit volume, and you're here, we can't simply allow you to leave. Please let us have some of your suit. We find out that Jeremiah is tasked with researching energy. Currently, he's focused on scorches. John tells him that since he gave him suit, he'd like the details of their research. John asks why he has Jeremy speak for him, and Jeremiah tells him because it's less effort. Jeremy goes on to hand John their data, but he instantly falls asleep, so they decide to draw it instead. First, 
The suit emitted by shadows due to negative emotions drifts lightly upwards until it accumulates enough mass, then it falls to the floor. After an average of two days, the piled up suit transforms into a scorch. It bears no connection to the shadow's will and moves solely through malice. Scorches of the same size can differ in energy quantities. It's to do with the density. If it's full of openings inside, it's weak. If it's tightly packed, it's powerful. When the scorch first develops, its density is one. If two scorches fuse together, they remain the same size and reach density two. And that regarding the recent phantom disturbance, before transforming into the phantom, the scorches seem to be density level three. And they will now refute his assertion that they are the culprits. They attempted to create a phantom in their own experiments, but they couldn't. No matter how high they raised the density of the scorches, they never grew to a larger size like the phantom. Sean asks if it's possible the phantom was made from suit powers. Jeremy tells him that's highly possible. They go over suit sickness. When a scorch enters the body, they act as parasites to control the host, but further details fall under the purview of the first aid team. However, it's possible that they desire a face. They stand up to reveal Jeremiah's latest invention. It's a new form of energy, scorch power. Motive power can be obtained from the wheel through this device that they then tried utilizing for suit grinding. John notices a picture frame and asks what it's for. Jeremiah tells him that it's used to exploit the scorch's tendency to move towards faces and to ensure it is recognized as a face, they use Nancy without her glasses. Oliver praised them for their invention and said that it could replace suit coal and become the house's energy source in the future. Oliver then shows up to the lab and tells John that he has to come to the star bearers meeting room. Then the episode ends. Some of my personal thoughts. I owe Shadow's house an apology. I thought it was pretty boring at the beginning, but it's really starting to pick up. And Kate must be some kind of super genius to be able to deduce what happened during the rejoicing party. And John is the exact opposite. He makes the dumbest conclusion and will probably be what causes their plan to fall through if it does. I was kind of surprised the roped figure just showed up like it was nothing. I always guessed the roped figure wasn't going to harm them at all. It's more just a force that's trying to do something within the house that we don't know yet a good episode overall but that's about it so yeah